Well, Christmas Day has come and gone, and it was not particularly kind to the Dallas Mavericks as they lose the primetime game Christmas Day against the Lakers, 138-115. to Now, there's not a whole lot to really say about this game in all honesty. Like, there's definite problems with the offense right now. The flow and spacing is not right. Luka scores 27 in the loss, but he's not shooting especially well he's 9 of 19 again uh, 2 of 5 from 3 so a little bit better than obviously his 0 of 6 the opener on the 23rd was but Luca hasn't looked like Luca yet teams seem like they've bothered him a couple uh, games now and part of that's just he's not in game shape yet he's not where he needs to be not having Porzingis out there certainly affects how well you can space the floor and do what you want to in that regard. But, you know, they've, they've got to figure some things out. Their spacing's not right. Their flow is not right. And you had a weird situation in this game where it almost seemed, and Trey Burke even kind of mentioned this after the game, like the Mavericks didn't really play with an urgency. They didn't play like they were fully invested. And that is very strange and kind of bothersome at this stage. Like the platform they had, the frustrating loss they had in the opener against the Suns, you would expect them against the defending champions on Christmas Day in the 7 o'clock, you know, prime time slot to really really try to bring their A game. And it just didn't seem like they were fully invested on that end. And perhaps the area this was most noted was in second chance points. The Mavericks got beat 35 to nothing, to nothing on second chance points in this game. That is the widest margin in 25 years. Carlisle said after the game, he doesn't think he's ever seen anything like it. You had Luka after the game talking about that and talking about the abysmal rebounding numbers from the Mavericks. They got out-rebounded 53-27, to including 17 offensive rebounds. You're not going to beat really anybody in that situation. When you get just utterly dominated and wrecked on the board, you're not going to have a good time. And that's what happened here with the Mavericks. So there's definite things they've got to figure out and work out. Luca in his two games now, I think he's had four rebounds in both games. So for a guy who averaged eight last year, he's off to a slow start there. And particularly without Porzingis right now, that's a very questionable, I would say, decision uh, to not go all in on that. And maybe that speaks partly to his in-game shape right now. I don't know. But they've got to figure something out because effort and hustle are not there. Luca kept really really going at the idea of like, you know, we got to box out. We box out, we win this game. I don't know about that one, Luca. I mean, they pretty well outplayed us in this game. And, uh, you know, they give they give up 138 in this game. Way worse, obviously, than the 106 they gave up to Phoenix. But to be fair, the Lakers are a terrible matchup for Dallas. Last year, I felt like it was a little bit more even footing, even though I still think the Lakers were a better team last year, obviously. But the Lakers... Despite being defending champions, they got significantly better because they got the reigning sixth man of the year, Montrez Harrell. He gives them 22-7 and seven off the bench. And oh yeah, they also got the runner-up, Dennis Schroeder, and he had 18-6. and six. In short, the Lakers, despite being defending champions and everything, got significantly better than last year's team that won the title. So this could be a really, really tough year for anybody going up against LA. I know they lost the opener to the Clippers. I think the Clippers came in with an extra chip on their shoulder and the Lakers may be a little distracted by ring night. Didn't really have the same, uh, didn't have the same energy and fire in that moment. But regardless, it's going to be a really, really difficult matchup anytime the Mavericks have to face the Lakers this year. They have nothing right now, especially with Porzingis out, to throw at them as far as that front court is concerned. And that really, really showed itself. What's worse is the Mavericks are going to now have to go up against the Clippers, staying in the same building, uh, go against the Clippers, and that front court is also probably going to eat them alive in this case without KP. So there's definite things that you got to figure out. But right now the Mavericks rebounding is terrible. Uh, in this game, their second chance point differential was obscene, 35 to nothing. I mean, that's that's your story of the game. 
rebounds and second chance points resulting from those rebounds. That is the difference in the game. I think the Lakers at one point on second chance, like just second chance opportunities, not just getting the rebound, but the actual follow-up shot attempt was like 12 of 14. I mean, just ridiculous how they were shooting and how they were finding ways to convert. And Dallas, you know, they kind of hung around for a little bit, but this was really a complete win for the Lakers. Like, aside from mid-first quarter, I don't think the Mavericks ever really had a lead at any point. They just kind of hung around, and for most of the second half especially, were anywhere from 12 to, I think, 16, 17 points down. It just felt like they were always at an arm's length, and every time it felt like Dallas was kind of preparing for a run, you would have the Lakers knock down another three. Three Three-point shooting was red hot for the Lakers in the first half. They started slow. They did start slow, but they turned it around and shot much better. By the time you got to half, I think they were like 8 of 15 or something to that effect from three, and it was a significant turnaround for them that paid dividends. So I'm trying to see here some of my other notes. Um, Mavericks at half trailed 69-57. Lakers knocked down like three threes in the final minute, I think, uh, to really stretch that out. But Dallas was generally there. And Anthony Davis, you know, doing Anthony Davis things. He had 18 at half, six rebounds as well. LeBron had 14 and seven. I mean, their main two guys just ran rough shot over the Mavericks. And Anthony Davis, seven of nine from the field, was, you know, phenomenal. Like, there, there's a reason the Lakers are so good. Yes, we talk about LeBron, who's about to be 36, and like how obscene it is that he's still as good as he is. But the fact that they have still Anthony Davis in the smack dab middle of his prime and the fact that he continues to elevate his game, he really, really is prepared to like inherit that Lakers squad whenever LeBron does eventually leave. But for now, uh, he is phenomenal. Like, I I think to some extent there was a little bit of not people understood and appreciated how good he was even when he was in New Orleans. But now that he's in L.A. and that he's kind of hand-in-hand with LeBron, like, right there at that level, it's just LeBron being LeBron takes a lot of the headlines. I think Davis is basically, I mean, it's essentially fine-tuned to be his team when the time comes. But there's a a lot to say about this here at the half second chance points where Lakers 22 to nothing over the Mavericks. Just obscene in that regard uh rick carlisle after the game gave a little bit of insight to as we mentioned porzingis and his status said he's weeks away not months well okay rick that sounds good except i want to hear days not weeks so the fact that you're indicating you know porzingis was initially trying to petition to play christmas day he said he felt like he could but he didn't expect the team to let him So after the game for Carlisle to still say, we're talking weeks? All right, weeks, not months. Does that mean that we're talking five weeks? Does that mean we're talking three weeks? Like, what does that mean? We don't know. But that's that's something that was probably intended to sound better than it did because this is a condensed season. We're playing, what, 72 games instead of 82? So the Mavericks have to figure some things out. And there's 12 very good teams in the West this year Uh, vying for a playoff spot, and they're going to have to figure some things out. I understand I'm not hitting the panic button by any means. It's two games. You have a very tough start to your schedule, and you're not at full health. Unfortunately, Luka is not in the kind of shape coming in that we would have wanted him to be, but all the same, you know, they've got to figure some things out. I think they're still better than they've shown us uh, in terms of the offensive scoring they had 115 here after 102 in the first game the efficiency hasn't quite been there although the three-point percentage was much much better this last game 13 of 32 for 41 percent uh the problems the lakers were 19 of 39 so you know basically 50 percent for the lakers from three that's just absolute sticky between the ribs dagger uh nothing you can do about that the lakers also shoot 56 percent from the field so the mavericks even though Uh, even though they held the Suns to 106 points, the field goal percentage was still too good that they allowed. And in this game, 51 of 91, that's, that's too, 
that's too high to give up here. And the Mavericks, they shot close to 50%. They shot 49%. But uh, there's just some things they got to figure out. Still pretty good at the line, 20 of 26, 77% for the team. The Lakers were 17 of 24. Mavericks still took care of the ball, nine turnovers. The Lakers had 16. The difference in the first game was that Phoenix turned the ball over a lot in that game, and Dallas did pretty well taking care of it. I want to say they had like 11 or 13 turnovers compared to like 24 or something crazy for the Suns, and that allowed the Mavericks to hang around and stay close. Well, here, the Lakers, 16, a little high for sure, but at at the same time, because of the rebounding edge and all of that and the fact that they were shooting the three the way they were, it didn't matter. I mean, the Lakers got contributions all up and down their bench. Lakers win the blocks battle four to three. Dallas does win the steals battle, surprisingly, 13 to nine. Josh Richardson, even though, you know, I know we're 0 and 2, and so we're not really looking at it a whole lot. He's, we still haven't had that next guy step up to be the big moment, big shot maker. You know, Hardaway has got off to a slow start here, but Richardson, 17 points, pretty nice, and he's still making very solid contributions on both ends of the floor that I like a lot. Trey Burke still looks like he's just as effective for us now as he was in the bubble, another 17 points for him. But uh, you got to figure out the Hardaway situation. Dorian Finney-Smith started hot in this game, knocked down a couple threes, and uh, kind of went cold from there. He had a big moment in the second half as well. I think it was the second half. It might have been late second quarter where he got a deflection that led to a leak out pass and a breakaway and Anthony Davis going like he was going to contest hard for the block kind of pulled back. And I think Dorian was anticipating uh, contact. He was anticipating that contact. And so he misses the dunk, just throws it off the back of the rim and it goes out of bounds off Dallas and Davis never touched him. And I think Dorian Finney Smith missed a, not a major momentum swing moment, but certainly one of those plays where you look at it and you're like, ah, oh, man, that would have been a nice jolt for the team because he made a phenomenal play. And then he went in hard like he was about to dunk on Anthony Davis. And I think that would have really fired up the bench a little bit. And instead, you get the result that you got, you know, uh, turnover missed on a breakaway dunk that ended up not being contested, really. Davis was in the vicinity, but he didn't go up high trying to swat the ball. He never made contact with Dorian. And so I think it ends up being a, a kind of a, a reverse card, you know. Um, it does more damage to your morale than it does boost it. So really rough go there. Uh, let me look here. So I said Luca earlier, 7 of 8 at the line. He's doing much better at the foul line to start the year. He was 10 of 12, game 1, 7 of 8 here today or yesterday. Even got a block in there. 34 minutes, so his minutes weren't high, but he's just not early on controlling games the way that he was, especially late last year. And he's talked about how he needs to have better shot selection, especially in the clutch. He needs to focus more on getting to the basket. His footwork and everything is phenomenal. He is way, way better. I mean, he shot like last season, something like 70% within the restricted area. Like if you get him to the cup, he finishes incredibly well. Just very savvy, very good footwork. And he's not doing enough of that early on. And he's got to figure that out. Uh, Hardaway, 4 of 12, 1 of 5 from 3. Like I said, he shot 40% from 3 last year. He really needs to figure this out because this is hurting Dallas with him just kind of being a flamethrower that is nothing but a little spark, you know? He's, he's a little match out there, not a flamethrower like he thinks he is early on. But he started really slow last year, too, so I know that he can turn it on. He's kind of a streaky scorer. That's kind of what he's been throughout his career. He goes through stretches where he's red hot, and when he's red hot and he's your third guy, you're damn tough to beat. But when he's not, he will shoot you out of games. He will definitely go in there thinking every shot's going in, even if he's one of 12. Doesn't matter, so... There's things for Dallas to address here, namely the rebounding, the uh, the offensive flow, and they've got to figure some things out. Any other performances here? Dwight Powell gets the start again. He goes 11-3, and 4-4 four four from the field, 1-1 one one from 3. Uh, man, Powell's getting beat bad and on the defensive end, and there were times where he was being put in really unwinnable situations with who he was matching up with. And I don't like putting Powell in that situation, particularly so soon off of his Achilles injury. 
I don't know what Dallas needs to do. I do know they gave Willie Cauley Stein, you know, 14 minutes yesterday, and he was two rebounds, 0 of three from the field with a block. He had a couple steals too. Willie Cauley Stein. Uh, some people have definitely been pushing for him to get more minutes. I've, I've certainly said that I would like to see him get more minutes. He didn't get a whole lot in the first game, but he got the opportunity yesterday, and he basically was a very limited factor. When you're 0 of 3 from the field, including a very, very easy reverse layup there early on, it's going to hurt your um, it's going to hurt your case for more minutes. So I don't I don't know what happens there, but you basically got. 17 off the bench from Burke, 5 of 10 from the field, 4 of 7 from 3. Burke continues to be that instant offense guy off the bench. I am glad they brought him back. I think he adds a lot to this team. But uh, Brunson's got to figure some things out too. I, I I ended up singing pretty high praises of Jalen Brunson after the Phoenix game. And I think a lot of that had to do with, you know, he made some tough shots late. He made some shots that I think kind of, obfuscated a little bit for me in my mind as far as the mistakes he made earlier on. Looking back, he is turning the ball over too much. I, I forget how many minutes he had against the Suns, but he had a three turnovers and limited action in that game. And he had three more, I think, yesterday. And so he's setting himself up in a situation where, despite having 14 to 16 whatever minutes per night, he's turning the ball over three times uh, in each game, that's too high for him, and he's not making some great decisions. I do think, um, I do think, in hindsight, that Suns game, he made some shots late that I think kind of altered my opinion on him and how he was performing. Now, again, this is a guy who hasn't played since it was the Atlanta game, I think, last year, and so I don't even remember what month that was in. I just know it was pre-pandemic. Uh, and he had like a rotator cuff injury that had to have surgery. And so, yeah, that's going to be a major thing. And maybe it just takes time to get his flow back. I do think he can bring a, a good bit to this team off the bench. I do like some of the intangibles he brings. But right now, he looks quite rusty in a lot of respects. And I think that's one of those things that Dallas needs to get figured out as well. Now, having Trey Burke kind of lessens the burden of that. But it's not enough to just lean on entirely. So, yeah, not a pretty game for the Mavericks. You you lose again 138 to 115. You're really out of it the entire second half, if not right before the half. You got, you know, they pulled away and you never really drew back even. Yes, you are at a disadvantage right now, but you don't have the luxury of excuses, you know? It's a condensed year. It's a very, very competitive Western Conference, and you have to figure out some things. You have to get better about the things that you're making mistakes with and if you if you come out as lackadaisical as you are in terms of effort or focus whether it be rebounding or offensive flow you're going to have a bad time and again with the Clippers coming up now tomorrow Clippers are 2-0 and and they've looked good so far the Clippers also made some very nice improvements Serge Ibaka is a very good fit for them Although, you know, he just knocked the shit out of Kawhi Leonard's mouth the other night, and Kawhi got like four stitches because he was bleeding everywhere. That was an ugly, unintentional shot to his own teammate. But uh, the Clippers are very good. Paul George has bounced back pretty well, although no one's going to care until it's the playoffs and they see how he does there. But he bounced back through the first couple games pretty well, and the Clippers are going to be another tough matchup tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. So yeah, from there, Charlotte, then Miami. So your your early season stretch has got a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, complications and a lot of difficulties. You're going to have a tough stretch where most of your first 10 games are going to be pretty tough. And they got to figure some things out. Hopefully they're able to do that. But for now, your first nationally televised game in real focus was the first game nationally televised. I don't remember if it was. But for now, uh, your real, real big stage on Christmas Day was a very forgettable one and certainly not one that's going to make a lot of people respect you any more so. But you got plenty of more opportunities. I think the Mavericks have like 16 or 17 more nationally televised games at this point this year. So they'll have opportunity. Let's just see what they can do with it. 
But that's it for my time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.